Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Lisa Tenner. Lisa guides aspiring authors to joyfully write and publish. Lisa has taught writing and publishing for Harvard Medical School's publishing course for over a decade and teaches award-winning book writing courses. Her clients have received five and six figure book deals, won prestigious book awards, and been featured by Oprah, NPR, Good Morning America, and all over national media. Lisa's next book, The Joy of Writing Journal, which I have an advanced copy of, comes out September 22nd, 2021. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Josh. I'm excited to have you on here now. You've got this background in helping other writers, but tell us a little bit more about your background and how you became a writer yourself. <laughs> well, um, I could probably trace it back to, well, probably even further. My dad's an English teacher, uh, and so he was always talking about books, and he, he'd give us the beginning, and then we'd say, what happens? And he'd say, go read the book, <laughs> which backfired in the beginning. We were a little resistant, but um, in the long run, I think we all became readers, and my mom was a big reader, too. But interestingly, I was more of a writer than a reader. I was a really slow reader. I still am kind of slow. And, um, and, but I did fall in love with books eventually. And like in high school, I started to become a really voracious reader despite my slowness. But um, by second grade, I was writing some books <laughs> and writing a lot of poetry and uh, kind of had this dream of being a writer even when I was little. And uh, then interestingly, uh, when I was applying for colleges, my father was all about, you know, go somewhere where you can really come out and get a job right away. And MIT had been actively recruiting more women and, and also just people with a more diverse background in terms of interests. And, you know, I had both the math and science and the writing and the creativity. So, um, so he was all excited and, and uh, went to MIT. And kind of interestingly, we had all these amazing writers there. MIT was, was actually paying a little more than Harvard. So they were pulling these, these great writers that, that supposedly they were fighting, fighting over with Harvard. Um, but I learned um, poetry writing from Gertrude Schneckenberg and uh, playwriting from Pete Gurney, who was just an amazing teacher. And uh, Frank Conroy, who at the time was the director of the National Endowment for Arts and Literature, and the next year became the executive director of the famed Iowa Writers Workshop, was at MIT for just this brief one semester. And I was so fortunate to be in his seminar. Uh, and he really taught me how to edit. And so when I edit people's writing, it's his voice in my head and it's all the things he taught me in that one semester that have really, I think, catapulted me on my career from a, an editing standpoint. Sounds like an um, amazing environment to be around all those people. It was, it was. I almost double majored in writing, but I realized I'd need an extra semester and more money. And, <laughs> and so that was enough for me to say, oh, I'll just minor in writing. But I took writing classes every semester, one or two, and just loved it. So you had this inherent love for writing. Did you have an idea of what you wanted to do with that while you were still going to college? No, I mostly read fiction. And then in my 20s and 30s, then, you know, I kind of more self-help and business and all kinds of other nonfiction types of books. But it wasn't really till I had this weird idea for my first book. Uh, and that was maybe, um, i trying to think when that was. That was, uh, I, I, out of college, uh, I went to MIT and I, then I took this job at pg e in San Francisco doing computer stuff. Sorry, my thing keeps coming out. Um, and that was, um, I'm not going to even say because I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in San Francisco, came back to Boston. And then when I was back in Boston, I was, um, I did a little bit of work for Fidelity, went back to business school and then worked briefly for at and and then a nonprofit, ran a nonprofit for 10 years. So that was kind of my big thing. And um, that was all 
uh, you know, while I did that, I still kept writing and I, I took a poetry class at Cambridge Center for Adult Ed and, you know, always had a foot in the writing thing. But it wasn't until I had a chronic illness that I actually got the idea for my first book. And um, it was, you know, it was lying in bed at night and I couldn't sleep. And I felt like this, it felt like kind of anger kind of in my body and I felt uncomfortable and I didn't know where it came from, what it was. But uh, I'd been taking this um, class called a polarity therapy. It was this kind of energy healing work that just I was curious about because it had helped me heal. And I was um, thinking, you know, in class, we learned that anger is just an energy and it's fire energy. So I imagine this fire energy coursing through my body and I suddenly felt much better. But then I had all this energy. I couldn't sleep because I had all this fire energy coursing through my body. And I um, I just thought, wow, this is really interesting. I, you know, started writing about how we can, you know, imagine anger differently and therefore be more creative with how we deal with that and use it to communicate in healthy ways. So that was sort of the gem of that book or the germ, germ rather of that book. I guess a gem as well. And I ended up really fortunately finding two amazing collaborators, Pico Todd, who was a cartoonist and added uh, these wonderful cartoons to the book and Jane Middleton Moss, who was really the person who had the credentials to write this book because I had no credentials to write, you know, this, this book except my own experience. Um, but she was, she is a um, uh, social worker and, and was, um, author, I think at the time already of 10 books, uh, most of them actually having to do with anger. So she was a big anger expert and often one of the featured speakers at health communications um, conferences. And um, so, so we wrote this book and then I started teaching workshops on anger with Pico and realized I had no interest in teaching anger workshops. People came in and they'd be like this, you know, the, they're husbands or wives had sent them and they, they, it, it was, I don't know, it wasn't that much fun, even though we were trying to tap into creativity. And, and I felt like I was over my head, you know, I wasn't really the uh, psychology expert or anything. I just knew about sort of this energy work way of thinking of things. So I, um, I was really struggling and I had my first child, so I didn't want to go back. I had run a nonprofit, which is an incredibly intense and demanding job. And I knew I didn't want to do that. And I wanted to be home with my child, but what, you know, kind of what could I do? I needed to contribute to the family financially too. And um, it, one day I just, it was sort of like a download. It was just teach what you did to write your book. And particularly it was these five steps for getting in the zone and, and getting in that creative space. So I started teaching that and I thought, oh, this is for artists, it's for writers, it's for creative people. But really it was the writers who came. And then more than that, the people who kept coming to me wanted help with a book or a book proposal. So my whole career was sort of informed by the people who um, really needed what I had to offer. And they really taught me what I was there to do and how to serve more than you know, some grand vision or business plan I had. It really just unfolded bit by bit, which is kind of an exciting way to find your uh, avocation and your love. And when you say you started teaching workshops on writing, how did you start those workshops? Who were you teaching? How were you getting people into those workshops? <laughs> this was in the days when you didn't have, you know, the internet was not quite what it is today. And so a lot of what I did was like making flyers. I did make them on my computer, but, and hanging them in coffee shops and stuff like that. And, you know, I said at first it was open to photographers and artists and, you know, some of those people came too, but it was really the writers who, um, most needed what I had to offer. And I started offering them retreats and, and, and pretty soon helped to really write a book. And, and it became my Bring Your Book to Life program, which um, won a Stevie Award for uh, Best New Service of the Year one year. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a fun journey, surprising in many ways. So when about was this that you started doing these writing workshops and teaching people how to write books? When was that? Um, 
I would say in the early 2000, like 2005, kind of around there. Um, yeah, maybe a little okay. before that. So it's been a good 15 years or so. And then you've also spent some time with the Harvard Medical School teaching them writing. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So it's part of the continuing medical education program. CME and doctors and therapists and, and others in medical professions need to earn uh, education credit, continuing education credits. And so this is a course that they offer. And it was the second year that the course was being offered. And it just so happened that my publicist, uh, we weren't publicizing the book actively anymore, but he thought of me when he was asked to uh, be a speaker and talk about PR for books. And he asked the course director and founder, Julie, Dr. Julie Silver, uh, do you need another writing coach? And she said, yes, I do. And so uh, from the beginning, I taught these writing workshops in the evenings where people would give us like 10 pages of writing and we'd give them feedback. And we'd also involve the group in giving feedback. Uh, and we'd have a panel that I was on where we would, um, well, sometimes we would have a panel where we would offer uh, information about working with a coach or an editor or working on a book proposal. And then uh, there's this pitching panel. So there's this pitching contest. You have to have like, I think it's three minutes. It's very short pitch and agents and publishers and book coaches like me and editors would uh, give people feedback and kind of rate them on there were maybe five or six items like their platform, like the book concept, is this marketable, things like that. And it's just like, boom, ba boom, ba boom, it's for an hour and a half each time, but it's really powerful. And the people get better and better at pitching, um, you know, each time they do it. So I've seen people pitch one year and then another year and another year. And it's amazing to see their growth and also what they've done in that time between the course. You know, a lot of them have worked on developing a platform and somebody who had no platform the first time they pitched suddenly has an impressive platform. So that's really fun to see people's growth over the years because a lot of people will come back year after year. And in the intro, we were talking about how some of the people that you've worked with have ended up on Oprah and NPR. Can you tell us about some of these specific cases where people wrote a successful book and it went on to do well? Sure. Um, one, one example is um, that I love is uh, Reset Your Child's Brain. And she, uh, the author, Victoria Dunkley, who's a psychiatrist, uh, when she came to me, she, she actually had kind of a broad idea for what the book would be. It was like all the things she, she would get a, a lot of the most difficult cases, people who couldn't be helped. And they were all children and they often were on multiple medications at once and really like challenging medications. And she, she found that there were a variety of things that affected them, you know, diet, sleep, uh, but especially screens and, uh, you know, Wi-Fi and other electronics issues. And when she would give, she would start out at, as she developed this with an electronic fast and then kind of bring things back in uh, to see how the child did. And when she did that, the results were remarkable. A huge percentage of those kids just, you know, were basically cured, didn't need the medications, but they couldn't do a lot of screens. And then um, uh, other kids needed some of these other things. But I said to her, you know, you're going so broad with all the things, but really, th and this was the time when people weren't talking about screens and what they do to kids' brains. So she was one of the first people really. And um, I said, you know, that's really the book is this, and, and that's often the case, right? As a a, an author might be thinking broadly of all the things they can offer someone. And it can be so much more helpful when you package it uh, as one piece, but maybe the most crucial piece and the piece that's been missing all these years. Uh, so that was, that was, uh, that was interesting because also she didn't have a platform at the time. And so one of the things we talked about was how does she get develop a platform but at the same time not give away all this research she did because it wasn't original research it was looking at all the research that's out there and what does it tell us about um, brains 
and the effects of electronics on brains, the effects of Wi-Fi on brains, and particularly children's brains. So she was sort of putting all of that together at a time when people weren't. Um, but you know, she could put it out there on Psychology Today, and and somebody with a bigger platform could just scoop that and, and write their own book. So we were nervous about that. I'm usually not nervous about that. Usually, you know, it's your book; it's not going to be scooped. But in this case, we were. Uh, and I was, so uh, I said, just, just blog tangentially for now. And so she blogged on things like the effects of screens on Tourette's syndrome. So something very specific or the importance of getting outdoors for kids and taking breaks from electronics. So she, she really blogged tangentially, not to the core message of the book. And she, um, she pitched to psychology today and they took her column, which is, um, Huh. I'm, I'm not going to remember the name of the column, <laughs> well, That's but, fine. Uh, but it's a great column. And, and it really now focuses mostly on the effects of screens and computers on children's brains and how to support your kids um, to have healthy habits. Uh, and um, so she, she also um, was, you know, really nervous about doing other things like TV, you know, that just felt so big and it wasn't a natural thing for her. But um, her husband actually worked doing video for the Today Show. So, you know, I encouraged her over time and she developed a pitch and she ended up being on the Today Show a couple of times. And that, of course, really helped with getting the agent and getting a publisher. They love to see that you've got some platform and that you're reaching people already. Uh, and now she's been on Good Morning America, really big features showing what she does with a family and in their home and the changes that they make and how it affects them. So they're really inspiring pieces. If you look up Good Morning America and Victoria Dunkley, you'll find them. Um, and then she also is whenever there's a panel about the effects of electronics on children's brains and how to help your kids with electronics, uh, she is, you know, almost always one of the speakers. She's really renowned in the field and, and other uh, best-selling authors refer to her work because it is really seminal in this area. So she's a great example. And I'll tell you one quick, am I talking too much on this one topic? Oh, this is great. <laughs> I'll tell you one quick tip I gave her. They really opened doors for her. And that was also, I think, before I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was before the book came out. Um, and she, I had gotten, it was the Huffington Post had sent something, I had subscribed and it sent me a morning email about this article on cell phone use for kids. And I just thought, oh, this is up her alley. And because they're promoting it, she should go and be one of the first comments. So I sent her an email, said comment on this right away. And in this case, include a link to one of your articles on psychology today, because you, we don't want to be spammy with that. But once in a while, it's really helpful to the readers to get more information. And this was a case where that was definitely true. So she did that. And her she ended up getting hundreds of thousands of more readers of her article. Um, because of that, just because it was in the comments. And then also on Facebook, she got all kinds of engagement and uh, she was contacted by other colleagues and she didn't really know other people doing this work at the time because there weren't that many. So somebody told her about a listserv and then she became part of this community, which of course, as you know, when a book comes out and you've already got a community of influencers who are going to support your efforts it really helps carry a book. So that was fantastic. She had really wanted to have one article in a um, research journal. She had never done that. And that came about, somebody contacted her because they saw her comment on the Huffington Post article and then her Psychology Today article. And then in addition, um, she was asked to write something for Scholastic News. So it, it was really a case of, you know, one thing led to another and another. And this is such an important thing to remember, you know, even just commenting on other people's posts and of course sharing the post too. You wanna, you wanna be a team player, right? And support that person who wrote that article. Uh, but even just a small step like that can open so many doors and really help pave the way for your own book. I think that's such a great example of how to do your own PR and how to get your message out there. Oftentimes we feel like 
well, I need to be the focus of an article. I need to get TV to interview me and focus on me and my book. But like you're saying, sometimes we can get a lot of exposure for our work by helping other people and supporting other people and commenting on their posts and sharing their posts. And sometimes when we give value like that, the value comes back to us. Absolutely. Quick break here. Are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to write a book that will help you grow your business? Visit PublishedAuthor.com, where we have programs to fit every budget, programs that will help you write and publish your book in as little as 90 days, starting at just $39 per month. Or if you're too busy to write your book, we'll interview you and then write and publish your book for you. Don't let the valuable knowledge and experience you have go to waste. Head on over to PublishedAuthor.com to get the help you need to become a published author. You've already waited long enough. Do it today. Now, back to the show. Well, let's dive into your most recent book then, The Joy of Writing Journal. Again, if you're watching the video, here's the, what the book looks like. It's coming out September 22nd, 2021. So by the time you're listening to this podcast, you'll probably already be able to go get it on Amazon. And I've been using this book. I mean, I, read, I try to read all the books that uh, are from the authors that I interview here on the podcast but sometimes I skim them. This is one I'm actually using and it's been sitting on my desk for the last month because I journal every day. And so every day I wake up and I start journaling and sometimes the ideas flow, but sometimes I sit down to journal and I think I have no idea what to write about. I don't feel like writing about anything. And so I'll flip through this and I'll find some prompt in here and I'll think, oh, I could write about that. And I'll start writing and it's been really helpful to me. So talk to us a little bit about why you chose to write this type of book, because it's not just a pick it up, read it from cover to cover type of book. It's very interactive. It's more of a workbook, really. So, uh, well, first of all, I'm so excited to hear that, Josh. It just makes my heart so happy. <laughs> um, and, you know, so the short answer, I think, is that I am a very experiential type of person. And the way I love to teach is just, you know, let's do something together, right? Let's create together. Let's get in that zone space together and um, really help people tap into their own creative source and their, um, their own voice their you know, it, it really teaching people to fish, right. Rather than fishing for them is definitely my orientation. And I think that I can be at times sort of hyper creative and just create lots of stuff and exercises and things. So it, it comes naturally. That's just, you know, a natural way that I tend to teach. Um, but actually um, there's another truth below that about this book, which is that I wasn't writing it. I was writing a different book that I think is still, I, that book is in its umpteenth draft. It's definitely going to come out after this one. But, um, but this book just like came forward in like a day basically. And, um, uh, you know, of course there was much work to do after that day, but, but the, the, the gem of the germ, I'm doing that again, gem germ, <laughs> the gem and germ of it um, came uh, in just overnight. So what happened was I have this colleague, Tamara Monosoff, and she published with McGraw-Hill quite a few books. And then when QR codes were for just first being introduced, she had this idea to put QR codes in her book and add videos in every chapter, one or two videos that would engage the reader and introduce the chapter and create some kind of relationship really between her and the reader. And, um, and so she did that. And now she helps other authors do that. And so uh, sometimes I have a client and I just think, oh, their book is perfect for having these QR codes with like audio meditations or video. For instance, um, Carrie Rowan is a musician and tell your own story is uh, a self-help book, but I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if every chapter had a song, you know, and, and a video and audio they could listen to. So I suggested to her to work with, with uh, Tamara. And then another client of mine, Lisa Langer, who's a psychologist, and Lisa wrote the book, uh, Deeper into Mindfulness. And I said, wow, you know, audio meditations, this is perfect. She should work with Tamara. And she did. And the book has won a few awards already. Uh, it's been out less than a year and it's already won a few awards. So um, those are you know some examples. And so I was talking to Tamara and I said, Tamara, would you ever go back to traditional publishing? And she said, oh no, never. 
And I was really intrigued by that. And, you know, for some of my clients, I always suggest traditional publishing. It just makes sense for their goals. And others, I would suggest self-publishing for a variety of reasons. Um, and for my own books, I, you know, wasn't really sure, uh, but I was thinking I'd go traditionally published with that book I was working on. But when she said that to me, it made me think, and I thought, you know, it'd be really fun to have QR codes in a book and do, do the kinds of things that Tamara does. You could, it's not that you couldn't do that with a traditional publisher, but not every publisher would know how to do that. Then they might not be into it. You know, it, it it's um, not as sure a thing. But she, when she said that, I went to bed that night and I woke up the next day with this idea for a book. It was the writer's journal to begin with. That was my, and, and actually a book for a whole series uh, of, of books. And I wrote not just the writer's journal, but the entrepreneur's journal and part of the spiritual secrets journal. You know, I just kind of had these ideas and went with uh, the prompts. And at first they really were, um, uh, I did have like 30 prompts, so a whole month's worth of prompts, but that was it. And then I gave that to some beta readers and they said, you know, give me more. I want to know a little bit about your relationship to this prompt or, you know, what brought it about or what it's going to do for me. And so I wrote a bit of, around that. And I have to thank Joshua Holm Edwards. Um, I think he was the one who suggested that. And, and maybe also Tracy Hart had similar suggestions. Um, but uh, I think that also shows, you know, writing a book is not like, oh, I'm a single person writing a book. It really is about community. And there are so many amazing people who help with this book. So when it came to doing videos, I'm not super comfortable with video. It always makes me nervous. And, um, uh, and so my friend, Portland Helmick, who is the, I met her originally doing a TV interview and with her. She had hosted a show called What's the alternative? And and uh, I think another show actually before that when she when she first interviewed me, um, oh on the Hallmark Channel. So um, so Portland actually did some coaching with me. She shot a lot of the videos. She was just an incredible support and help for this project. And then she recommended Dan Tebow of um, oh now I'm forgetting the name of his company, Fast. Fast Twitch, Fast Twitch Media. And Dan did those little, uh, if you've, when, when people who are watching uh, see any of the videos, you'll see this wonderful little animation in the beginning. And he did that and he put the videos together. And to make his job a little easier, I had my son doing some of those, um, what do you call it when you have the lower third where you put the information about the person? Uh, yeah, the... Uh... The yeah, thing. The, the thing. <laughs> There's a name for that. Um, so like a Chiron nice, type thing. Yeah. Kind of. so, but yeah. So my 14 year old did that, and uh, Luke. And uh, so, you know, just there's so many people who help you create a book. And then Tamara, who did that beautiful cover and um, the inside, and, and she did the, all that QR code stuff, which is not easy to set up. So she, I always do this wrong, but she set that up. And um, she was just such a joy to work with and, and still is. So um, yeah, it just speaks to what a team effort it all is. And so what's your goal with this book? What was the objective? What did you want to accomplish? So, you know, it really, uh, I th like it just came to me. And so I can't say like, oh, I had this goal in mind when I first wrote it, but I think it came from a place of, you know, which is, which is kind of always a piece of what I want to offer people is to make it easy and fun and joyful to write and to easily get into a state of flow. You know, that that's a big thing that I'd like to help people with. And, um, and so, uh, and, and then also to develop a habit and, uh, you know, this is a 30 days book, so you can really use it to write every morning, eight minutes a day, you know, and create this writing habit. And that's a powerful thing to do. I uh, will go through periods where I'm writing every day and then other periods where I don't. And, you know, I think that writing every day, having a habit like that is amazingly powerful. But if that's not how you work, don't beat yourself up over it. Um, writing, you know, I, I, my writing coach actually said she, she goes like this too. So, um, and she's written many wonderful books. So really don't worry about 
that piece of it, but it is powerful to develop a habit. And this certainly does help you do that. And I wanted things that, that, you know, were some that were just super easy and maybe you wouldn't go that deep and others that maybe are a little deeper or just more wacky and creative. And I, I wanted a whole variety of things that would make it fun to work with and fresh and, uh, and then also that could really interact with video or audio well so that uh, and, and with the video and audio, some of it, I think, you know, this was like at the beginning of COVID. And I think some of um, maybe I started it before that. I can't remember, but it, it, it was right around the beginning of COVID. And my sense was, wow, this could really help people who are feeling isolated to feel like a sense of community, but it wouldn't take them a lot of time. They don't have to look at somebody else's writing or it really would be just to watch this short video and see what other writers are saying about the prompt or, or um, how they're responding to it. Uh, so, you know, it, it, was, it was meant to create a sense of community. And, um, and in October, we're actually going to do something where I, I've worked on the book all summer uh, in the sense of doing all the prompts myself. And so in October, I'm going to share little snippets of that each day, matching day one on October 1st, et cetera, and give people the opportunity to share a little snippet from what they wrote or about the experience. Sometimes I'll share, I think, more about the experience for me. And, you know, there's, there's, I, I think that's going to be helpful because sometimes I didn't like the prompt myself. I felt so much resistance. And I said, well, you know what? I'll just do the five, the list of five or 10 things and I'm not gonna do the prompt question today. And I left it and did the prompt question the next day. And then I was really surprised. Some of those were the most fruitful or fun or um, maybe went a little deeper and maybe that's why I had resistance to it. So it, it was neat to see how when I gave myself permission and not do the, the, the exact way that I had written it for, um, that actually opened things up. So I want to share those things with readers too. So they give themselves some freedom and flexibility. Yeah. Sometimes it really helps to sleep on it and then come back to the writing the next day. I'm working on a, a memoir, which is just personal. I don't think it'll ever see the light of day outside of my family, but it's for me and it's for my family. And some days I'll be working on it and I'm excited, but then my energy kind of drains as I'm working on it. And then I get to a point where I just say, uh, I could include this, but I think I'll skip it. And whenever I start thinking that, I just say, you know what, just stop writing, come back to this tomorrow. And then the next day I'll come back and I'll say, no, I really do want to write about that. And now I've got the energy to do it. And so I'll write in detail about that part. But if I just sat there and wrote eight hours a day, there's so many things I would be leaving out because I would just be tired. And it's not that it's not good for the book. It's just that my energy level goes down throughout the day. And sometimes pretty quick. Sometimes it's like 20 minutes. I'm like, ah, I'm done. Yeah, there's, I find too, there's this phenomenon of like, um, I feel like I want to skip over something. Like, oh, I don't feel like writing about that. And that's often the deeper stuff, but it's, I think you're right. It's like, I don't have the energy to write about that right now. That's a great insight. Yeah, a night's rest can do wonders for uh, keeping yeah. it going. So with the Joy of Writing Journal, what's the goal for writers? Who, who should be using this book? Is this to help aspiring authors to figure out what they want to write a book about? Or is it just to help people get comfortable with writing so that they have more writing ideas and they build up their confidence as a writer? But who are you thinking of as you created the Joy of Writing Journal? So I always tell my clients, you know, it's so important to be really clear and specific about who can benefit from this. And, and it's not everybody, but, um, but when I think about it, there really is a broad spectrum because anybody who wants to develop a writing habit, this is going to be helpful. And I think create more ease in developing the habit than maybe if you had to work on a book every morning, which I think is a lot more pressure and and might be a lot more time too so people who are want to write but are kind of stuck for time um people who you know maybe if you're working on something and it just feels so intense and you want something a little easier to first like work your way into that state of flow this can do that it can be kind of that stepping stone to flow um but also somebody who's thinking i want to write something i'm not sure what let me just play with this and see and i wouldn't be surprised if something like a book or an article comes out of some of the exercises. So it could be um, 
the potential to generate material. And, and then, you know, it's not just for writers, it's for anybody who wants to journal because there's so many benefits of journaling. And I, I did I did write this in a way that I think you don't have to see yourself as a writer or be a so-called writer. You know, we all write something. Um, we all write emails. Uh, so, you know, just anybody who wants to explore a little bit of, of, you know, the inner world, outer world, any of that, I think it can be a valuable tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've experienced the benefits of journaling, journaling so much in my own life. I used to journal, once every six months or something. I have one journal that's not that thick and it took me about 10 years to finish it because I hardly ever wrote in it. And then a few years ago, I started journaling pretty much daily. I mean, I'm, I miss a day here or there, but pretty much every day I put something in there. And some days I'll write three pages and sometimes I write three sentences, but pretty much every day I put something in there, but it just helps me think things out. It helps me find answers to questions I have. It's kind of like meditation in a way, it just helps my brain calm down. And of course, then I've got this record, which is so handy to go back to later and say, when did I do this? And what was I thinking at this time? And what's what was the story there? Why did we make this decision in our family or in the business or whatever? And I've gotten mm -hmm. so much value from that habit of journaling each morning. Yeah, it, it is a great tool for personal growth and, and insight as well. So what was the book that you were working on when the idea for this came along that you said you're going to write one of these days? <laughs> so that, that book um, is, you know, it's similar in some ways, but there's, there's more memoir to it. It's, it's, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a memoir, but there are stories that begin every chapter that um, I think are little beautiful moments maybe in my life. Uh, is a human being and also as a writer. And so I usually tie whatever, well, I think I do in all the chapters, sort of tying whatever that lesson was in that moment to, um, to writing. And sometimes, you know, it's about animals. I meet in my, on my day, I was uh, in the woods and, uh, and singing, singing my prayers in the woods, just kind of, uh, which I, I just love to, to be in nature when, yeah, you know, when I go deep, nature's just so supportive, I think for that. And this deer started coming towards me. And I always think of deer as, you know, a, a very shy animal, right? They'll run as soon as they see you, unless they're in the headlights and then they just stand there. But it came towards me. It wanted, it was, it was, I think it felt the sacredness of the song. And, um, and that was, that was really a lovely experience. So I wrote about that or, you know, just writing about, um, uh, and, and I have, I live in a lovely little community. It's called Saunderstown, Rhode Island. And, uh, it's a place where everybody knows your kids, you know, your kids speak and connect with people of all ages. They'll help the neighbor get the groceries out of the car. Um, it's just a very lovely community. And, um, and so, you know, sometimes I read about that, but there's short, short, little stories and then um, kind of weaving into this writing lesson, whatever that'll be. And then I have often a uh, practice that goes with. So some of the stories also are about this practice, but it might be a breathing practice. I, I practice Qigong. And so it might be a practice from Qigong that especially breathing practice or even a yoga practice, but something that uh, ho often helps us tap into um, uh, our vitality. And I think when we tap into our vitality, like you said, you get tired, it's hard to have that, that quality to the writing that's very powerful. And I think when we have vitality and energy, we have more to offer. And, uh, and people often talk about the breath as right being, um, um, like the Holy Spirit, right? That that's like, the breath um, is, is a sacred thing. I think it's so many religious traditions. So, um, so there, there's that sense too, that the breath really brings something in when we, when we bring our attention to deep breathing, you know, it, it, it enlivens us. It inspires, right? The word inspire even comes from breath. And so, 
Um, so we have some kind of practice that might be, like I said, a yoga or qigong breathing. Most of it's a breathing practice. Uh, and then that's followed by some prompts that, that often will playfully relate to the story or the, the breathing practice. There's kind of a weaving. But again, it's a book that's experiential and it helps readers tap into their creativity. So it's a similar spirit to, to the Joy of Writing Journal, but kind of a deeper dive, I would say. Mm, interesting. We'll look forward to that coming out. Thank you. So as we get towards the end of our episode here, we're wrapping things up. Can you talk to us a little bit about, as a book coach, as you're coaching people and mentoring people through the writing process, what are some of the most common challenges you see these writers facing and how do you help them overcome them or how do they overcome those challenges? So um, one of the biggest is time, right? None of us has time to write a book or we don't think we do. And so often it is helping them see what's on their plate and what they're willing to let go of to make the time for the book. And, uh, you know, it might mean, and this was an example, someone who might bring your book to life program, um, it might mean saying, okay, uh, what's coming up? I've got this huge thing on this fundraising committee and it's going to take so much time. Maybe it's time to get off that committee and train the person to replace me. And she did that. And that was crucial. Um, so it's, it's creating that space and time and then being consistent about it. So I have people schedule it in, you know, Wednesday from four to six, very specific times that they know they're going to be writing. It doesn't have to be every day, but it, it, and it could even vary week to week, but it's in their calendar. They're treating it as sacred. Um, another piece is confidence. And I think, you know, partly confidence comes from doing the writing and sharing it. You could share it with a beta reader or a friend or a client or colleague, um, or you can hire a coach and get feedback or hire an editor and get feedback. And as you work with a professional, you probably will become a better writer too. And uh, certainly somebody who, who nurtures your, your gifts and talents, um, but also knows what's missing. Uh, is going to help you to become a better writer. And all of that's going to help increase your confidence. Uh, you can have also community. You can have like a, um, a self-led writing group, or you can join a writing group or join a course. Those are all ways I think that can help increase that confidence and also tap you into that sense of community and uh, potentially accountability as well. So in, in my course, I often have this accountability partner and you answer five questions. And I, I can thank Mitch Feinberg for these five questions. They're such great questions. What did I say I do this week? What did I actually do? What worked? What didn't work? And what's next? So part of the beauty of those five questions is you're not coaching your accountability partner and you're just listening and they're coaching themselves, right? And, and what worked and what didn't work is going to inform what they do next. Okay, so I'm going to do more of what worked and here's how I problem solve what didn't work so I don't have the same problem this week. So it's really simple and really powerful. Oh, that's great. Now, you mentioned before we started recording, you've got an ebook that people who are listening to this are going to be able to download. Can you tell us a little bit about that resource? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to have to look down to look at the title. It is called 12 Ways Journaling Can Spark Your Creativity, Support Your Writing, and Transform Your Life. And so it, it has the 12 ways that journaling can transform for you. And then it also has some ways to journal. I think it's seven ways to journal. And uh, they're, they're really fun and powerful ways and different ways to journal. So somebody who's thinking they want to journal and isn't sure how, these will give you some great ideas for getting started. Perfect. So go find the show notes for this episode and we'll have a link to that there. You'll be able to download that ebook that Lisa's given away. Lisa, thanks so much for being with us here today. Where's the best place for people to connect with you if they want to learn more about you and your book writing programs? Thank you. Uh, LisaTenor.com is a great place to connect. And I do have a blog that I write uh, every other week. And uh, in addition, I'm on Instagram, Lisa Tenor writes with um, between the words, it's got the little underscores to join them. Um, and Twitter is Lisa Ten at Lisa Tenor. Perfect. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us here today on the Published Author Podcast. 
My pleasure, Josh. Thank you so much. And I wish everybody lots of inspiration as they journal. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 